Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the um, special meeting for the Public Infrastructure, Environment, and Sustainability Committee. Uh, because of the Christmas holidays, we thought we would have that meeting this week at this morning hour. Um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the October 26th and November 23rd minutes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. Any discussion? All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right. And we're expecting Council Member Stratton to come a little bit later, and hopefully Council Member Kinnear, but we're not sure. So we will uh, go ahead. I didn't have any requests for anything from the consent agenda. Um, but if someone has something, all right. So if you're here for the consent agenda, you don't need to stay unless you want to continue to listen in. Um, we don't have anything from on our legislative update for today. I'm going to go ahead and skip to um, Catherine Miller to hear about the SRTC interlocal agreement update and then future legislative transportation package funding. So, Catherine. Good afternoon, Council President. Just getting my bearings here. Did you uh, want the funding package first or just look at your agenda? It, it's up to you. You can, okay, whatever no makes sense. I'll just follow the agenda. Yeah. So, um, my understanding is the state legislature will be putting forth a uh, request for, for future projects. And we were talking with council president last week and he just asked to share some of my past experiences with calls like this. And uh, this is not to say uh, the state legislature will, will proceed the way they will, but my experience uh, in the past of these types of requests typically have come with some kind of a shovel ready uh, statement to look for projects that would, can proceed uh, quickly. Uh, the one that came out of the, um, I think, the crash of, of uh, 2008 with uh, the Obama administration coming in and talking about shovel ready, that came with 120, I think, 25 day response time that we were required to put a project to bid uh, within 100 and some days of, of getting uh, the okay to move forward. That was an incredibly short amount of time. Uh, to, to move forward. So we were only looking at projects that were effectively already in the system and especially projects that had already gone through major steps like environmental as well as right away. And um, those were the ones that we were even eligible effectively to, to move forward as we went. So when we're looking at the call that came out for this current request that seems to be focused on pet and bike, and I know that Colin Quinhurst, uh, along with several of, of ICM staff, have been working uh, with the BAB on creating a list uh, potentially to put forward the state legislature. Again, it's focused on projects that uh, would be able to move forward quickly. Uh, IE didn't have a lot of significant right-of-way issues, uh, had progressed along uh, with, with design and or uh, scoping, so it wouldn't be a starting from scratch and potentially losing an opportunity uh, to move a project forward for, for the city of Spokane. So just to share with council, that was some of the, some of the thinking on the, the project list that I believe, if you haven't already seen, is, is, is working its way toward, toward you all to, to take a look at. Uh, one of them um, on the list is uh, Fish Lake Trail, uh, which is the last piece which is in the middle of the trail towards the, the, the Fish Lake side of the trail. It's got two bridges that need to be uh, fully constructed. Um, that's work that we've done a lot of engineering design on. Uh, the design was, I want to say, about 30% complete to date. Uh, there still is, there's no right of way in the sense that we own the trail. Uh, there is um, air rights that we need over uh, the, the railroad. So while there is a, um, um, a right-of-way process there, it's not as onerous in a general statement. And I say general because dealing with the railroad is, uh, it brings a, a lot of process with it, but felt that it had, had enough design work and um, 
Um, it's such a focused last piece in terms of getting those two bridges uh, in that we thought it could at least uh, be on the list. Now where, where you council takes that or the legislature takes that, that's another step, but just some of the thinking behind it. Great. Council member. Council member Mum. Hi. I have so struggled with Fish Lake Trail because it's not in the city when we spend money outside of the city. And I know the park board at one point had created some kind of position statement that they didn't want to invest any more funds outside of the city limits because they have to maintain the, the trails that they don't own. And I'm just hoping at what point do we feel like we want to hand this off to the county for the county to take the lead? Or where do we sit, uh, you know, intergovernmentally with the county on this project? Um, if, if there's certainly probably an update since I last heard about this a couple of years ago at the Parks Board. That's a good question. I'm not tapped into where the county's at today. I just know historically they verbally uh, have, have uh, been in support of the concept. The city of Spokane owns the right of way out there uh, in terms of the actual layout so you know how the county perceives this i think at a state legislative level um, maybe that's where it shifts but i don't know that there's a champion at this point to uh, be working with the county directly to kind of pick up the mantle and i think that might be important for us to be clear on before we do any kind of an ask uh, at some point you know this is in the county and you would think that the county parks, either we hand it off to them. It, it's a, I think it's something we should loop Garrett in on because we're maintaining several miles of trail outside of our city limits, and those funds could be used uh, inside our city limits. So just thought we should probably clear that up. I'll work with Eric Paulson on that and, and you and, uh, and others on the team. Council member, um, um, this is Garrett. I'm on here. So um, I just wanted to uh, mention here, sorry. Um, wanted to mention we are having a task force with a county, state, and city of participation in the Fish Lake Trail. Um, like Catherine said, this is City of Spokane right away. Now, the Spokane Park Board did take an initiative on acquisitions, any future acquisitions outside of the city limits and investing in those, um, but they did highlight, you know, having the infill acquisitions around Palisade Park in Camp Sakani. Besides that, when we look at additional property, um, the park board is gonna be more cognizant on how we determine what is the best fit for the citizens. But as far as the Fish Lake Trail, it has been in our six year capital for some, uh, plan for some time. And so working with the state parks in rec and county, uh, we are working on a task force to try to come up with a more collaborative effort around that funding package rather than falling on the shoulders of one agency. Um, so more to come there as well. And I would highlight too, Catherine hit, hit on some great projects. We do have a few others in, in the pipeline as well that are 100% designed and ready to go and do have partial funding too, which is important. So when we talk about shovel ready, it is nice to be able to, um, you know, if we look at a 50% match, that, that a lot of your dollar goes a long way. So um, Don Cardon Bridge is on there as well. Um, that is shovel ready, ready to go. We have about 50% match. And then of course, um, the South suspension bridge is um, fully designed and ready to go. So some other infrastructure and bridges as well um, that are fully designed and have partial funding. So all good projects again, that can potentially depending on how the state describes uh, what will um, uh, projects will, will be eligible. will hopefully we'll be able to fall into some of those categories. That's all I had, unless you had any other questions on that topic. Moving to the interlocal agreement with SRTC, um, the state legislature put in a new RCW that is requiring that all MPOs, metropolitan transportation organizations, include tribes as voting members within that organization. And SRTC has now met twice with uh, membership uh, within SRTC right now to discuss, discuss going through the process of creating that, that opportunity as the RCW is requiring. There are some um, uh, discussions around uh, recently the airport board has left SRTC 
and with the new uh, census coming on, that will also uh, impact um, voting membership. There's a dialogue about trying to wrap effectively all three of those topics, removing the airport, bringing in the new census data, and bringing in the voting membership uh, all into one interlocal agreement uh, effort. The last time this particular interlocal agreement was opened up, it took about two years in process, uh, especially at the end when every single one of the memberships uh, have to obviously go through their own local process for approval. So it just takes a while to get to everybody to get them all to vote and then to finalize that process. So um, I think the last meeting was pretty successful in the conversation to recognize that I think the, the board membership has uh, uh, um, it seemed like to me two topics going on specific to the, uh, to, to the tribe. One was to bring the tribe into uh, the actual interlocal agreement and they would be a full member signing the interlocal agreement, paying the dues uh, for the interlocal agreement versus having them come in as a, uh, as a voting member, but not necessarily part of the interlocal agreement. So I think there's some good dialogue coming forward. Uh, to see where the full membership wants to land on that. And Council President, I'm sure you can share your thoughts that you shared uh, with the rest of the group in terms of actually bringing them into the interlocal agreement themselves. It was also clear that um, uh, at least those present, you know, we've got the small cities, we've got obviously county, uh, Airway Heights, uh, Liberty Lake, and, and the rest of the small groups were, were present at the meeting. Um, several of them brought their their leg, or their local um, agency lawyers to the to the meeting. So I've been working uh, with with our side to see if our lawyers will will at least attend the first meetings to see how much we can uh, make sense for us to participate at that level in terms of the lawyers are going to get together and kind of go through the questions that the board membership asked uh, and then to bring back uh, some potential solutions or or options to those questions. So that's where the last meeting ended effectively. They're going to start up the next round of meetings the middle of January, I believe, uh, to move that uh, process forward. But there is a August date um, to have – still not clear to me, Council President, please jump in on this part of it in terms of I don't believe we have to have a full completed done because, again, I think actually signing this document will, will go beyond August, but I believe we need to at least have a full offer uh, out there and an understanding how we're going to proceed is likely how it's going to play out by August. Yeah, the um, the state law that I think Representative Richelli was championed is that they, if there's a change in the governance, there has to be an invitation to any tribes that are located within the metro region that that encompasses the SRTC, and regardless of that, there has to be an invitation. Uh, by August of 2021, there's not a lot of detail about what that invitation means or what it looks like, which is leading to a lot of delay on it. I think everybody uh, wants to make the invitation and comply with the law, partly because if we didn't, we would lose uh, potential access to a lot of state funding. Uh, but it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing. Our interlocal agreement, it requires... Um, 100% agreement, which means any current member of the interlocal agreement can veto any future interlocal agreement. But at the same time, now that the airport has left, we have to do a new interlocal agreement. So it's a, it's kind of tricky. Really, the question for me is, since the tribes are going to, we're going to have to negotiate what their membership is. The question is, do you include them at the table early on and get a do that negotiation, no matter how hard it is? Or do you try to do a negotiation with all the current interlocal agreement members and then start the negotiations with the tribe? So as you could tell from the way I pos posited that, I prefer the former. And I would say the board is kind of mixed at the moment. And we thought we had a deadline of December 31st. And WashDOT uh, waived that deadline for us. So we're going to extend into January. And the other thing that's a little yeah. bit strange, just one... So we have two SRTC board members, um, Councilmember Burke and Kinnear, but this ILA group is a different, uh, it's not the board, it's just one person from each jurisdiction. So it's a little different. It is different there. Now, it's also interesting to hear that other MPOs across the state uh, 
don't necessarily have one answer to this question either. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's really a regional decision in terms of how to fulfill this request. Yeah, so I was thinking about talking to Representative Richelli and saying, you left it too vague. Please, <laughs> please specify for us. We'll do it, whatever way. But there's not much bandwidth at the legislature this time. All right, Catherine, thanks so much for uh, getting us up to date on both of those things. Um, so Thank next, you. oh, did you? Did anyone have anything else on the, either of those? Okay, great. Uh, next, we have a um, uh, recommendation from the Sustainability Action Subcommittee around accessory dwelling unit reform. And I think I'll kick it over to Kara Odegaard to get that started. Great. Thank you. Um, as Spencer is preparing to put up our slides, I'm just going to, I just wanted to make a quick um, little introduction. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to call your attention to an addendum to our ADU recommendation that I e emailed out on Friday morning. It contains some additional concerns from our SAS, SAS members. So please take a look at it um, if you haven't already. So thank you for all of you who have already reached out to me in the last couple of weeks to discuss your concerns and who have brought forward legitimate considerations on how we might approach ADU reform. Already, this recommendation has done exactly what we had intended it to do, is started a conversation. This ADU reform recommendation is a joint recommendation between the Affordable Housing Workgroup and the Sustainable Action Subcommittee, more commonly known as the SAS or the SAS. Uh, this is the first time that our two work groups have collaborated on an initiative, and we're still learning how to make this process meaningful for council members. Uh, nonetheless, Melissa and I are very excited to be here today presenting to you in collaboration. Um, before I pass the reins along to my colleagues, I want to take just a few minutes to share with you um, how this recommendation came about and to briefly reflect on our practices and policies when it comes to making a recommendation to Council. Um, just as a reminder, the FAS is comprised of approximately 40 volunteer members from the community. Each member brings with them specific area of expertise. Uh, we have members or, that have expertise in the energy sector, transportation, natural resource management, waste and recycling, and the built environment, just to name a few. The Planning and Land Use Work Group collectively holds professional expertise in urban planning, bike pedestrian planning, and architecture. It also includes community advocates promoting access to public transit and safe cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. Like all our SAS work groups, the Planning and Land Use Work Group spent time researching their recommendations by reaching out to other jurisdictions, concerned residents, city planners, and local developers. It's important to note that even though we spoke to community members outside of the SAS, the recommendation itself was initiated and revised internally by members of the SAS and the Affordable Housing Group. At the highest level, the goal of the Planning and Land Use Work Group is to research ways to increase urban density, address missing middle housing, while also considering responsible use of our natural resources, including trees, water, and land. Additionally, we saw an economic opportunity since ADUs use existing infrastructure, which provides a cost-saving benefit for the public as compared to building on previously undeveloped land. With all of this in mind, we decided um, that this AD recommendation would be a great starting point, and we see this as an opportunity for low-impact infill development that has many environmental and social benefits. This recommendation is not going to solve our housing and environmental issues. We see this simply as one tool among many, and we also recognize that each neighborhood in Spokane has its own unique challenges and opportunities, so we're open to feedback on how we might address those. It is our understanding that this recommendation, if supported by Council, will follow the plan commission process, including further review and outreach. Today, we're simply presenting one approach and asking City Council to help us ensure that the City has a meaningful conversation on the pros and cons of ADU reform. Just like any recommendation that our initiative managers bring forward, it's up to Council to decide what, if anything, that they would like to do with it. Uh, to quote Councilwoman Kinnear, if this is done right, it could be an asset. If it's done wrong, it could be a disaster. The SAS and the Affordable Housing Work Group want to ensure it's done right, and we hope that Council will agree to add ADU reform to the 2021 Planning Commission Work Plan. 
So with that, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Spencer Gardner. Spencer is a project planner for tool design and specializes in bicycle and pedestrian planning. He's also a regular contributor to Strong Towns and serves on the board of housing, Spokane Housing Ventures. So Spencer, uh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, before we talk about some of the code changes we proposed, I wanted to just um, briefly run down some of the benefits of ADUs. Um, Kara touched on a few of these in her introduction. Uh, so the, I think everybody understands what an ADU is. We're talking about an accessory unit, a secondary unit that sits uh, behind a regular single family home. Um, we can get into that more if we need to in the, in the questions afterwards. Uh, the first benefit, we can, we can provide more housing for Spokane residents uh, without consuming land at the edge of town. There's a lot of uh, benefits that come from that, including uh, less, less driving to get to jobs, uh, stores, other opportunities. Um, we can also leverage the existing infrastructure rather than building new infrastructure. Um, and we, we can also provide a, a variety of housing in neighborhoods where uh, there's a lack of variety. Um, this, this brings a lot of benefits, uh, for example, the ability to age in place um, as a family grows and gets older and um, people look to downsize, for example, an ADU is a great opportunity to downsize but retain um, a little bit of land uh, for gardening or outdoor activities, things like that. Um, perhaps a homeowner wants to uh, move into an ADU and then rent out the large house um, to supplement their retirement income. Um, so it provides flexibility in that way. It also um, can, can improve the uh, income variety in a neighborhood. Uh, so uh, some neighborhoods are harder for lower income families, for example, to afford to live in uh, because ADUs tend to be smaller housing units. They tend to cost less as well. So that opens the door for um, more, more diversity in that way. Um, okay, let's talk about the, the changes. I have a page for each of these, so I'm not going to read through these. Um, the first change is uh, to allow for two ADUs on a lot. Currently, there's, uh, there is an allowance for one ADU. Um, there would still only be one detached ADU allowed, but a second ADU could be internal. This could be like a basement apartment um, or a small addition uh, that is attached to the house. Um, the second change was a simplification of the dimensional limitations. So uh, the, the detached ADU would be required to be um, smaller than the primary structure. Uh, an ADU could not be larger than 1,200 square feet, and the height could not exceed the, primary, the height of the primary building. Um, we also did, uh, we, we wanted to anticipate uh, situations where uh, the, the dimensional limitations maybe don't uh, apply very well in the context, for, for example, for a smaller lot or a strangely shaped lot. Um, and so we included the opportunity for the planning director to grant exemptions. Um, the third is building bonuses for ADU construction. So the goal here was if we believe that ADUs are a, um, a worthwhile and valuable uh, form of housing for Spokane neighborhoods. Um, we wanted to provide some kind of um, incentive for them to be built um, in recognition of those, of those environmental and uh, affordability benefits that they bring. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of floor area ratio. This is a part of the zoning code. It, it dictates how, how large a building can be compared to the lot that it sits on. So one of the changes is to allow for a small bump in that floor area ratio for an ADU that is built. Um, not only does this provide an incentive, um, but it can also help a, a homeowner to, um, uh, who, who may be running up against the current limitations to have that, uh, that additional leeway um, to build that additional ADU. Uh, the other one is uh, the, the total lot coverage. So this is just a footprint of the building covering the lot. And again, um, we proposed an additional 400 square feet of allowed lot coverage for an ADU, and it's the same thing here. Um, first, it's a recognition of the benefits that these provide. 
um, and it's also a way to uh, to help homeowners on constrained lots to uh, have have opportunities to build an ADU, even if uh, they're running up against the current constraints. Off street parking requirements. Um, of course, parking can still be provided, but it would not be required um, for that unit. Uh, parking requirements in general are actually one of the most um, constraining parts of the zoning code. Um, developers, any developer will tell you this. Um, the, the need to, re to provide that off-street parking uh, trips a bunch of design requirements and um, additional costs related to the design of a housing unit. And so by removing those requirements, uh, we, don't, we don't require that additional process, especially, again, on constrained uh, infill lots where uh, the, the site conditions can, um, can be especially difficult to work with. Uh, and uh, from a sustainability perspective, since this came out of, uh, partly out of the Sustainability Action Subcommittee, um, we just felt like it wasn't appropriate to be housing, uh, requiring housing for cars when we really need to be requiring housing for people. Um, we also proposed to eliminate design requirements. Um, the thinking here was that we wanted to level the playing field between ADUs and other housing types. Um, in most neighborhoods, there isn't currently any kind of design requirement for a single family home. Um, as I've walked and biked around my neighborhood, I've seen some very questionable architectural choices uh, on, on the single family homes. Um, and. Uh, we felt like it was unfair to subject ADUs to design requirements that, that we weren't holding other building types to. Um, in addition, some of the design requirements that, that, were part of, that are part of the existing zoning code, things like roof pitch and window sizes, don't, don't, don't always translate well to a smaller building like an ADU. So if you're, if you're forced to match the roof pitch of the, of the primary house, but you're building a very small um, ADU, that, that can... Um, create some design challenges, and then window sizes. Um, you're, you're, if your primary house has a certain size or arrangement of windows, uh, the interior space of a small unit like an ADU may not, may not even really allow for that to happen. Um, the other challenge is that the design requirements, as they're currently written, I think could be, um, are up to some interpretation by planning staff. I'm guessing if you were to talk to the planning department, they don't actually like having to uh, interpret design requirements um, unless they're very specifically laid out. And so uh, they would probably appreciate not, not being the arbiters of uh, whether something meets a design requirement or not. Um, and then ownership flexibility. So one of the proposals is to uh, eliminate the requirement for an owner to live on site. Um, this is a common feature of ADU reform in uh, codes that are being reformed around the country. Most notably in Oregon, the entire state has actually eliminated this requirement um, they, in, in this most recent legislative session. So cities are no longer allowed to impose this requirement on, on Oregon cities, and that, that is statewide. Um, the other change that we've proposed is to allow ADUs to be sold separate from the main house. Um, the, the vision for this is that it would fit under the pocket residential subdivision uh, portion of the zoning code. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the idea is that it allows for a subdivision of a, um, of a lot that uh, would require the subdivided lots and the buildings on those lots to still meet the standards of the parent lot, but uh, for purposes of selling that lot and uh, ownership of that lot, it, would be, it could be subdivided for fee simple ownership. Um, and so uh, the goal here was to boost the opportunity for home ownership. So uh, someone could build an ADU, um, subdivide that lot, and then sell the ADU as a, as, a separate, um, uh, as a separate house. This could be a way to um, provide lower cost housing to families that are looking to, to own a house, um, and in particular, own a house with, with a small yard or um, space for a family, for example. Where Can you censor? Yeah. Um, just, I had a quick question, if that's all right. Sure. Kind of on this topic, because you're talking about ownership, like selling it, is there going to, like, are we looking at any stipulations on the use of the ADU? Uh, for instance, long-term lease agreements rather than short-term lease uh, providers, so... 
uh, Airbnb type of stuff. I, I feel like this would be a great opportunity to make an extra buck for a homeowner, uh, but not actually provide stable housing for anybody in our community. So I'm just uh, wanted to touch on that. Yeah, we uh, we did not. That was not part of this of the this proposal here. As Kara mentions, this is really just kicking off a conversation. So that would be a great topic, I think, as this moves forward and hopefully heads to plan commission. Yeah, I think that that's just really important because if we're going to use this as a piece of our affordable housing crisis, we really need to actually focus on making it housing because I've just seen so many articles about how uh, Airbnb industry is really hurting our housing industry because uh, you can make a lot more money by doing Airbnb and it's a lot less um, strenuous on the infrastructure of a house uh, rather than having someone live there long term. But it really hurts our uh you know, our, our infrastructure if we don't have uh, something like that in there. So I just wanted to note that as something uh, moving forward that should probably be a large part of the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll turn this over to Melissa. She was going to talk about some of the companion recommendations. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so in some of our conversations and our, our research about EDUs, we've really read and learned a lot about um, changing the code and the regulations isn't enough to really encourage, encourage ADU development um, because EDUs are different than the traditional home. Um, the, the funding opportunities and getting um, capital um, access can be difficult, especially um, when we look through for an equity lens. And so one thing Kara and I have um, done is we've, we've spoken with Alex and, you know, started that conversation to make sure as we, as we work on a program like this, we're doing it intentionally and trying to help people at all, um, at all levels be able to access, this, access something like an ADU if it's something that they desire for their, um, for their home. So a couple of recommendations that we ran across looking at how other cities are doing it is one, um, working with the um, design firms for pre-approved detached ADU plans um, that can bring down the cost to, um, to property owners if it's something that they are interested in. Um, developing education and outreach program um, to really help um, make sure people understand what um, the possibilities of ADUs are and also if it's something they're interested in. Um, helping them know where to start so you're not feeling like you have to um, call anonymous faces and um, not know kind of how this process could work. Um, third is, and I think this also speaks to something that Councilmember um, Burke brought up, is really how can we use ADUs to target um, lower income um, Home or families or individuals that are, are looking for um, access to safe and stable housing. And one of that is looking at some federal and state funds um, or using city funds to help encourage ADU production. Um, this would, of course, require income um, eligibility requirements and putting in agreements that if people are receiving any kind of subsidy or incentives or funds, to help build these programs that they do have affordability requirements um, for both income, but also long-term affordability requirements. Um, because if, they're, if we're using any kind of funding sources, we wanna make sure that what we're doing is having the intended impact, which is providing more housing to people um, in our city. And then finally, working with some local financial institutions to develop products that can help people build ADUs um, on their pro property because um, it, you can't get a traditional mortgage or it might be hard to get, you know, funding for that big of a purchase. We need to, to find something locally that people can access and that people at all levels can access, not just uh, middle to upper middle class um, homeowners because there's property owners all over the city that might be interested in a, a product like this and working with a program. So making sure we help develop or um, encourage a program that people can can take part of. Um, and so one example that we've been looking at, which is the next slide, is um, the Seattle has started a, a ADU website um, that really is, I think, pretty user-friendly. 
and helping people look at what the process of putting an ADU in is. Um, they have links to different pre-approved designs um, and then some ones that didn't necessarily make the cut for the pre-approved design is also shared. So people can get a really good idea of what opportunities are out there and what might work for best for their home, but also um, give some clear information of how someone could walk through this process. So um, in the affordable housing work group, when we, you know, there was discussion of a need of how do we help local developers or, you know, local architecture um, builders build more ADUs and reaching some of our, our local producers. Um, but also how do we encourage more affordable housing options, keeping in mind, we want to make sure that we're encouraging more affordable housing and not just building um, units that might become short-term rentals, but trying to tie it towards producing more options uh, for people to live in. Um, I'll just add one quick thing, uh, and then I don't know, Kara, if we were gonna open it up for questions, but um, there are a few cities around Washington that have uh, undertaken similar reforms. Um, just to give one example, the city of Tacoma in 2019 passed an ADU reform, and they saw their ADU applications uh, rise from about one, at one application every two months to uh, about nine per month after the reform. So we see this as an opportunity to really boost the production of this type of housing. Yes, I'd love to invite any questions or comments from council members this time, if you have any. And Spencer, if you take down the screen, then I can see people a little better in case they do. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions? All right. Uh, council member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, just wanted to, uh, thank uh, Kara and Melissa and uh, their work groups for helping put, put this together. Um, I, to me, I, I think for, for this policy to be successful, it needs to be as broad as, it, as we possibly can make it. And I think anytime you create another limitation as to the, the how, when, and where uh, an ADU is, is built, uh, I think you lessen the effectiveness of the policy and make it more likely that it's just not going to produce what what I think we, we need and, and hope for it to produce. So to me, putting limitations on it, things like saying you cannot use this as an Airbnb, I think that dissuades people from building this. And while one owner might use it as an Airbnb, the next owner might rent it out to, to you know, an, a family or, or to an individual who, who needs a, a place to live. Um, and, and that second owner wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that had the first owner not decided it was worth it to build it in the first place. And I think you have to think about this in the long-term sense. So any of those obstacles, I think, is gonna reduce the effectiveness. There's a couple other things I would love to see us include in here. Uh, one would be to allow for alleyway access uh, for, for these homes. Um, I think that that's a really important one. There's some cities that are doing some really uh, neat things with, with alleyway homes. Um, and I think we need to remove the uh, backyard setbacks um, that might lessen where uh, some of these ADUs can be built up. And then also I think some of those uh, size limitations might need to be looked at as well. And I, so I just hope we will allow this to be as broad as possible for the planning com plan commission's review and analysis. And of course, they'll make their recommendations and then the council will, will decide what, what should uh, get passed in the law. But I think the broadest policy we can deliver to them for their analysis uh, would make the most sense. And so, uh, again, I'm just glad that, that we're taking this step, uh, hopefully. I think this is one, one of many, but one really important tool that we need to address the housing crisis. Um, and so hopefully we can, we can find a policy that, that really works for, for our community. Council Member Mum. Thank you. Um, really appreciate all the hard work. My gosh, when I went through all the documentation, this looks like there's been a huge, huge deep dive. I also respect the minority report. I agree with several of the questions that need to be asked. I remember when we debated this 
15 years ago, I think, when this was first put together, and many of the same issues have come forward. I, I'm recalling the reason we had the owner-occupied requirement was just for the reason that Council Member Burke was discussing, to make sure that uh, it's well cared for and that it still um, has all the bells and whistles of a, of a real house and, and doesn't turn into a de facto hotel or something like that. So that was um, one of the restrictions that we put on at the time. Um, I'm also concerned in general about the bat, what I call a backdoor lock split provision in some of the, the, you know, no parking, you know, other limitations, um, you know, backyard setback for this. And then you go and you lot split it. So somebody has to go spend a whole lot of money to meet our current code, but then you sort of backdoor it. And, and that's something I've seen happen in other communities. I want to make sure it's fair. So if we are going to let a lot split happen, it has to look like a duck and act like a duck, which is what the rest of us have, is provide off-street parking or whatever. So let's be mindful of that. So I'm a little hesitant to direct the Planning Commission to reform this. I'd really like to let them work their process. We have a meeting I think we're trying to schedule in January where we sit down and look at the whole work plan. When I asked, and I, I shared this with some of you, when I asked planning staff, how many units do you think we actually could get out of these kinds of reforms? They said they estimated about 20 a year. And in hearing what's happening in Tacoma, maybe it's more than that, but if it's nine every six months, I, I guess that's maybe 60 units a year. When we look and sit down with them at the work plan, I hope we can assess all the other things. Something has to come off. So if we're gonna put ADU on, we have to take something off. So let's ask that question when we sit down, how many, um, units can we get out of the other reforms or other things that we're looking at on the work plan. Happy to discuss it. I think there's some really great ideas about the education. I think we could do that without changing. There's a lot of recommendations in there we could do without changing our ADU rules at all or messing with our comp plan. So excited to see if the administration can pick that up and run with it. And I think if we promoted our current ADU um, regulations, we might get more just out of that. So thanks so much. Other council? Questions, comments? Welcome, Council Member Stratton. I just wanted to acknowledge you. Thanks. Um, okay, great. Well, one, so I just had a few comments. Uh, one, super excited that um, all this great work was done and super excited that the housing and the sustainability are uh, overlaying on each other and intersecting. Uh, I think that I really see a lot of opportunity um, for this and perhaps in a way to move forward initially uh, condition a lot of these things on providing permanently affordable housing. So there's there's a lot of ways to do that. I did just want to recognize, I think the, and maybe it's not fair to call it the Airbnb phenomenon because that's just a specific company. There are other companies that do it. I think we really need to address that and I think we should address that robustly in 2021 irrespective of this. Um, we still don't feel like we have very good compliance of people getting their licenses um, and then what the impacts are in neighborhoods. So I think that's somewhat of a separate issue that we can address uh, separately. The other thing is, uh, this does have to go to the Planning Commission, but I'm open to us doing some council work on it before uh, the, at least the Planning Commission finishes its work. I, I would hate for them to do all their work and then it come to us, and then we have a whole bunch of other ideas that we want them to go in. So I really think we should schedule some time um, either at this committee or um, urban experience or even a separate group and maybe even some community engagement uh, with folks who have lots of questions um, to really kind of come up with some priorities that a majority of council would um, support so that the Planning Commission knows kind of that direction before they bake it too far. But I do think that this potentially has a huge upside. Um, and especially, I think to me, the biggest takeaway is that whatever our policy is and however we do it, we should make it super understandable and easy to finance, construct, get permitted, uh, because your average homeowner is not a contractor or developer. So it just needs to be very fair and equitable and easy to do. And I think it has a, a great opportunity to both increase housing units uh, that are affordable and also 
that whole idea that anyone should be able to live in the neighborhood that they want to, regardless of their uh, income. So it, it kind of democratizes uh, neighborhoods, which most people would say that's a good thing. Some people don't think it's a good thing, but I think we should explore it. So thanks for that. And then Kara, I have you down next for an update on the National League of Cities Leadership in Community Resiliency Grant. So go ahead. Yes, I just, I, I think uh, as our new process for um, small grants uh, that are applied for by council, we're meant to uh, introduce them to city council. And this grant is for $10,000. It would help the Sustainability Action Subcommittee um, put together a more robust um, environmental justice framework for the work we're doing. Uh, we already have um, an, uh, an equity review process built into the SAS, but what we're lacking is the ability uh, and partnership with community-based um, organizations to, to actually get information on the ground from the communities that are most um, likely to be impacted. And this grant would help us to do that. All right. Um, so what's the timeline on the application for it? Just It's due on the 23rd. Okay. Okay. Anyone have any comments about applying for this grant? Okay. Great. You checked that new box. We appreciate it. It's uh, more effective that way. Okay, that's the end I have of council requests, unless I see any late breaking ones. And then I would like to go to staff requests. And the first one is Jason Sandoval, who uh, brings us a rec report annually on the uh, apprenticeship program that we have. So Jason. There. You're on mute still. <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Good morning, all, and yeah. uh, thank you for having me this morning. I will uh, share my screen here and get rolling. Okay. Look, we are good here. All right, so this is our annual Public Works Apprenticeship Program report for 2020. I'll be talking about the apprenticeship utilization process update that uh, came with some changes that we've had this year. Uh, the apprenticeship utilization report in summary and uh, talk a little bit about our grant that's associated with the ordinance. So just to kind of review the apprenticeship utilization requirement, it's 15%. Uh, it's on public works projects valued at greater than $600,000 and subcontractors uh, underneath that contract with contracts uh, greater than $100,000. Uh, we accomplish it through compliance uh, through our bidding requirements and also contract documentation. Uh, we've continued this year with uh, continued contractor education, reaching out, and also training. Uh, some of the changes this year that I think um, helps in a couple different ways, helps uh, with the uh, transparency of the uh, ordinance, but also with the, um, also with the ease in which uh, contractors are, are participating. Um, we're processing the apprenticeship utilization report upon receiving the final acceptance of the project. So uh, once we receive that final acceptance, that's filed with the city clerk. So it's kind of publicly known when the project is uh, finished. Uh, the journeyman and apprenticeship hours are now being tracked via certified payroll that's filed uh, with the Was with Washington State Labor and Industries. So that also is readily able to um, be viewed by just not only us, but anybody outside the project also. It also gives us an opportunity to track their certified payroll in real time as they're required to submit it monthly to kind of check to see the status and updates of uh, their apprenticeship hours. 
uh, the utilization numbers are being calculated now from the official by their approved affidavit of wages paid after the final releases um, received by LNI. So once LNI certifies all their um, affidavit of wages paid for the project and releases the project as 100% complete is uh, when, when we calculate those numbers. And so the apprenticeship utilization report has been uh, for the past couple of years filed with the city clerk upon completion. And so um, kind of making the program very transparent in that all, all records that we, we keep and maintain uh, should be available to the public either via the LNI website and or the city, the city of Spokane's uh, city clerk's public record search. So I, I thought that was, um, we're still kind of making it, um, doing a few things to ease the uh, ease, uh, ability for uh, parties to locate it, but I think we're, we're getting there to, you know, at least the transparency portion of it. So as of 2020, we had um, 11 projects between January and November that, that uh, qualify for the apprenticeship utilization. Um, that we received the notice of completions on. And it was approximately $30 million in public works contracts. Uh, we had a 16% utilization participation rate across all qualifying projects, which amounted to about 90,000 uh, journeyman hours and 14,000 apprenticeship hours. Uh, this past year, we've also collected about twenty thousand dollars in fines. Uh, last year, we issued uh, seventeen hundred, um, about seventeen hundred dollars in grants to seven grantees in October of twenty nineteen. Uh, the grants were used to establish new or expand pre apprenticeship programs targeting minority women, uh, veterans, and CEZ citizens. So this year. Um, we postponed our grant issuing to March of 2021 due to COVID. Uh, some of the uh, pre-apprenticeship programs were not running due to COVID. They weren't able to have gatherings. So we decided instead of uh, issuing it, we wait till and the climate changes a little bit. And uh, that's kind of the gist of it. Any, uh, any questions? questions or comments for people? Councilmember Wilkerson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, uh, for the update. When I first came on council, the first thing I started asking about was this particular project and apprenticeships, because there has been quite a groundswell from the minority community of what the city was doing and how they could engage. I got to tell you, when I asked the question, nobody knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So that was a little disheartening for me uh, out of the gate. So I'm glad that it has elevated itself and that you're making it more accessible to people to find out. I have discovered that everything at the city is almost secret um, and really not available to the community on an easy path. I look forward more to learning more about the grant process going forward and how we get that information out there to all the community um, in a more timely and informative manner than trying to find our way on the city website. So uh, I love to partner with you on that particular outreach. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Like I said, with, uh, um, I meet, go to meetings. They have an apprenticeship council meeting once a month, and I'll attend that a few times a year. Uh, just to kind of get their feedback and, and what's working and what's not. And uh, periodically throughout the year, I'll meet with uh, uh, different um, different apprenticeship coordinators from different areas to find out uh, how, you know, the accessibility. I, I just had a meeting a couple months ago with a, a group and kind of walking through the process on how they could locate uh, the results. And so... I'm working on a few things next year to hopefully make it easier because a lot of the things, like you said, it's not uh, necessarily the most user-friendly uh, way to look up things on the city clerk's website. Uh, but uh, 
be able to produce. We do have an apprenticeship web page that um, I'm hoping to be able to disseminate more information. And um, as far as the grant, well, it is, I have, we reach out to these different groups and kind of I do a little presentation telling them uh, that the grant is coming up. So we'll be doing that again here in the beginning of 2021 to promote that grant. Is, um, I think we, we have money to give out and uh, I'd like to give it out and put it to use. And the community would love to receive it. So we look forward to that. Thank you. Other council questions or comments? I'll just add mine, Jason. Uh, again, uh, you've been doing a great job. It seems like you have this program more than whipped into shape. It's going smoothly. Uh, people who are at least in the business understand it. And, But I think I, I've been hearing a lot from the community about, okay, how can it be even better, um, particularly how do we expand apprentice utilization across different trades as opposed to just the 15% average on a job, so the various subtrades. And so I'm thinking about uh, asking council to look into updates, and I'm hoping we can invite you back maybe to the March PIES meeting to give us your views on what's working best, what could be working better, what the competing views are perhaps of contractors or subs or uh, unions, uh, non-union training programs, whatever it is, so that we can kick something off and just take it to the next level. So um, expect to hear from me formally to get some of that, but um, I just wanted to note that it's really only because you've really gotten it working well that people can really start imagining, oh, it could work even better. So thanks for your work. It's been great. No problem. Thank Council you, Member sir. Stratton. I just wanted to mention to Jason, this is on a much smaller scale, uh, but in terms of things that we could be doing or things that we can be looking at, um, about a year and a half ago, I had a neighborhood in my district, a block, um, with uh, two elderly homes, and the sidewalk was completely crumbled. I mean, it, it, you could barely walk on it without falling. And the two elderly um, couples that lived there continued to work in their yards and try and shovel snow and they were constantly falling and getting hurt. Um, so of course, we, you know, there's not a lot of money the city has to go in and fix sidewalks. The elderly couple couldn't afford um, the cost to repair the sidewalks. And so I had called the um, AGC, uh, Mike Inkeny, oh, yeah. and worked with him because their apprentices, before they get done with their, their six weeks, they need a project. So we worked with the AGC and for the class coming up, their project was to repair that sidewalk. And they did a great job. And we sat down with all the city folks and talked about it, make sure there wasn't a problem. Um, we helped them pull the permits they needed and everybody won. The apprentices, um, those, those in that program got their, their project and so they could graduate the neighbors are still will call and keep me updated on the sidewalk to let me know how it's going. But even those little things make such a big difference. And if we could, you know, grow something like that, I know we had staff here at the city that was very willing to work with them. Um, they couldn't do it. And so at that meeting, we talked about what other projects are out there that the city can't take on that we can partner with the apprentice uh, programs and the union and non-union groups across the, the city to help us out and to um, ultimately give those students that um, project work they need. So I'm more than happy to participate in anything like that if, um, if that starts to grow. I know the, the door's still open that if people need to do something like that, they're going to give me a call and I can update you, but it worked out great. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. All right. Again, thanks so much, Jason. And, All right. Um, and let, thank you for having me. Yeah. Let's move on to a um, presentation on the Intermodal Facility Utilization Plan. And I have Tanya Wallace as lead on that. Good morning. Hi, council members. Good morning. We are really excited to bring this 
uh, forward to you. Um, Dave Steele and Arian Schmidt have been working on this, and so we wanted to present for you just a very high-level um, directional presentation about what we can do with this really, I mean, I love the building personally. I think it's got some great architecture. It's a great historic building um, for the city. So it's how can we utilize this asset a little bit better going forward? And what do we need to do to get it to that higher utilization? So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dave Steele and Arian Schmidt, who have been working on this. Uh, hello, council members. This is Dave Steele. Um, uh, Arian is going to be running a slideshow that kind of walks through some very graphic uh, imagery of the floors and things like that. <clears throat> and it allows us to kind of look at uh, the floor plates. It allows us to kind of get an idea of the cost and uh, revenues associated with each floor. Um, Arian's done an amazing job just kind of digging through all this and boiling it down into something that, that makes, you know, sense. Uh, intermodal is always kind of, it's, we, you know, it's been part of the, the city's inventory since the 90s. Um, it has always been a difficult location. It's always been difficult because of its standard hours of operations. Um, but I think this really kind of lays out a, a, a very nice draft of, of possibility of how we could start to move forward and look at uh, bringing it more into line as a almost a net zero rather than a, a, a constant loss leader for the city. So. Great. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, I uh, did want to just start with uh, him undergoing kind of the concept of a name change from inner moment to the depot. So, uh, Tanya, I mean, um, Arian, we can't hear you very well. Yes. Could you, Arian, could you speak into your mic more and start over? Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, I'll just speak a little louder. Um, so, what we decided to do, uh, like uh, David was sharing, uh, is give you kind of a, a very high level visual overview. Uh, with some very high-level um, numbers. This is really intended to be the first of a number of conversations, depending on how council feels um, they uh, want to move forward on the store footage, the contracts, the investments, as well as the potential revenues for this facility. How am I doing, Council President? Arian, you're still a little hard to understand, so I'm not sure... You can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect um, my audio to the phone. Okay. Great. My apologies. All right, let's try this. Is this better? Much better. Thanks. But you want to turn off your sound from your left of your computer, probably. Okay. We will make up for lost time, folks. All right. So on the first floor of uh, the depot building, um, we have the floor plan here. It is color-coded by basically what's utilized, uh, what's open, and what may, may have potential revenues. One of our uh, anchor tenants, pretty much our largest anchor tenant is Amtrak, and that is the square footage that they, they roughly use. Um, their hours of operation, I think, as you know, are, are very um, non-daytime, and just recently has kind of decreased even more. I think as we go forward, uh, we're going to want to utilize that as, a, as an assessment point um, and um, for some proactive um, visual boundaries to help us with um, the securing of space. There are uh, two other pieces of interest on the first floor. One is the blue area, which is currently utilized by the Spokane Police Department for their TAC team and the bike storage. And um, we've been talking with um, Chief Meidel and the county, and we've got actually a potential storage place for them on the public safety campus that um, really be better fits them for that usage anyway, which would then allow us to look at some rent potential. It really uh, has some um, 
high uh, curb appeal due to the roll-up window, the first floor access. So once again, if the desire of city council is to look into that, that is some potential revenue space. The other area that first causes uh, the need for some investment but will definitely recoup in a number of areas is that escalator area. It has been probably broken more than it's been operational over the years, and um, the escalator removal uh, will then require some rebuilding both on the first floor and the second floor, but then gives us um, rent potential in a kiosk-type environment that um, could definitely yield ongoing revenues. Any questions before we move on to the uh, bird's eye view of the second floor? And go ahead and just volunteer, folks, if you have questions in this presentation. But I'm not seeing okay. any. But go ahead. Thank you. So the second floor, our primary anchor tenant is Greyhound. Um, this uh, contract is up for renewal uh, near term. So once again, as we formalize um, our roadmap and, and pro forma, this, this anchor tenant um, contract does uh, yield some opportunity, whether that's to um, free up some space um, and maybe co-utilize staff space for both Amtrak and Greyhound employees, once again, um, giving potential for more retail revenue. But once again, this is how it looks today. There is a small amount of what we're calling kitchen space uh, that is under a very small rent that will once again become up for, for review. Uh, it is that food space area that we could utilize and enhance if we want um, a more robust um, potential uh, rent revenue that could extend into areas that currently are, are not in use at all, which is the um, purple. Once again, we will actually recoup um, some pretty significant um, space when we remove the escalators and um, then finish that floor on the second, um, second level. Now, in addition to the stairs, there is a functioning elevator that would accommodate for persons that need assistance unable to use the stairwell. Lastly, the third floor uh, is not designed for public access, and in our highest and best use um, consideration, this would be for a dedicated office space. The elevator does go to the third floor. There are two interior stairwells that would be a part of um, secure access as well as exterior um, accessibility for these anchor or, or um, uh, dedicated employees. We have an anchor uh, tenant on the third floor, and that's the Spokane Regional Transportation Council. Uh, and they, uh, they are a long-term, not only tenant, but also infrastructure um, um, recipient. Pioneer, or excuse me, uh, Frontier Behavioral Health has just recently signed um, a contract for significant office space. Please note that that yearly expenses include the tenant improvement for year one. That would not be ongoing, but was a part of the original contract. And then there is open office space uh, available, once again, on that third floor for um, dedicated personnel. One thing that we wanted to show as we kind of put all of these three bird's eye views together are some costs that we feel that we want you to be aware of, both on critical and investment level strategies. The first is for um, the HVAC control system. Uh, the property manager indicated to us that it is um, a breath away from failure. To replace it in a planned manner would be about $25,000. If we waited until failure occurred, that would be an upwards of about $120,000. So regardless of what we decide to do on our roadmap, they highly recommend, and uh, Dave Steele can give you some more details, that we go ahead and proceed with this $25,000 investment um, proverbially yesterday. Um, then in addition to that, the Spokane Police Department did a crime prevention through environmental design assessment for the ground, primarily for uh, what borders on the arterials on the eastern edge, um, I believe that's Brown um, or Howard, uh, and... Um, the good news about that is we are working with um, some other uh, SEPTED-eligible revenue sources that would allow us to implement that 
um, without any sort of general fund obligation. The escalator removal and remodel on the first and second floor is estimated at that $55,000 uh, uh, amount. And then those other items, the Amtrak divider, the new door access, painting and lighting, lighting are really those that are going to impact our ongoing security and um, just base m &O. We have um, sliders that are really not conducive to the hours of operation and can integrate a more kind of traditional door with a timer access that will really allow us to decrease on our um, contracted security by adding um, visually pleasant but um, uh, uh, access uh, obstruction type of dividers, whether they be um, in a, um, you know, uh, glass or um, rod iron design for the ion track area, once again, just allows us to preserve those areas for just the non-traditional hours of usage. Painting and lightning, once again, is um, cosmetic, but due to the age of the building and since the time that it's been done, will definitely allow for an update on um, environmentally um, more efficient uh, ways of uh, operating the building. So uh, that in addition with, once again, for those investments, potentially new uh, yearly revenues is what we're looking at. So really, as Tanya indicated, this was our just idea concept for you. Does this align with some of the ideas that you as council had had for this building? Uh, um, and if so, do you like these ideas or do you want some time to mull on it and in the new year, come back um, and talk about this uh, further. Council questions, comments? Council President. Council Member Cathcart. Um, yeah, th thanks, Arian. My question is, um, with the new revenues, which looks like a little bit more than about 150, is that is that gonna make up for what we're losing annually on this, or is it just, just an improvement? I thought it was about 300 that we were losing. So I'm going to let Dave talk about that. We've got a lot more to dive into um, some of that, but a lot of it is because of how it's used in non-traditional hours right now um, that is causing the really kind of balloon of expenses and lost revenues by retrofitting access and hours of use. Um, we're going to be able to actually decrease our M&O significantly. Dave, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I can just give a little bit of detail around that is just we spend a tremendous uh, amount of money on security uh, due to the hours of operation of the facility, due to the, the fact that it's empty a great deal of the time and yet is required to be open. Um, and the other large cost that we face is uh, janitorial. So between those two, uh, with these improvements, we believe we can bring those costs down and then these additional new revenues uh, bring us almost, like I mentioned, to a net zero. And that's kind of been the goal. Um, you know, I know, we've been significantly upside down for a number of years uh, as, as, our, as our costs kind of outstrip our, our lease uh, improvements. But uh, this gets us real close to zero, if not, you know, at zero. And that's kind of been the goal. So one, one last question for, for Dave, how much usable life is, is left in the in the building itself, is there? I mean, is there quite a bit without a lot of uh, uh, further maintenance and and remodeling down the road? Uh, there is kind of yeah. Uh, as far as usable life, I mean the the you know the the HVAC system is one of the biggest pieces. Um, as Arian pointed out, you know that's <clears throat> that's a fairly insignificant. I mean it's I mean twenty five thousand still twenty five thousand, but. Um, to make that swap now, you know, you're, you're saving yourself roughly $100,000. And, and that comes down to the, not the systems failing, but the software failing and having to rebuild the entire database of, of all of the, the various hydraulic actuators and, and times and senses and, you know, all those things. Um, we did just replace uh, several of the chillers over the last few years. Um, you know, so as far as kind of a long-term look at the building, yeah, there's a lot of useful life in it, um, but there are a lot of deferred costs that we, we, we've set aside and we kind of need to start addressing. Thank you. Council President? Yes, Councilmember Wilkerson. So, so, so Dave, the increase in security 
Has that just been rising yearly, or we've seen a significant uptick just in the last year? Uh, this year was was significant. Um, over over the the last number of years, we've we have tried to manage security in a way that you know we provide. We were providing security only during the hours hours of operation of Amtrak, Greyhound, things like that. Um, but the the kind of spillover into non Amtrak Greyhound hours uh, was was doing a lot of damage to the building. So we've had to continually try to adjust and shift. Um, and then this year, with with COVID really uh, decreasing the the ridership and you know the the use of the facility, we had to you know significantly bump the the security to to deal with the you know the emptiness. So. This year is definitely a, a more significant anomaly, but it has been a, a steadily kind of climbing uh, price. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if it's Arian or Dave that can answer this, but in the third floor on the frontier section, you kind of had the one-time tenant improvements and the annual M&O cost all lumped together. I'm wondering if you could break that up for us. I think in our subsequent um, uh, deep dives, we sure can. Um, the third floor is one that we're, we're really still trying to understand utilization preferences on, so absolutely. Um, Frontier is the one that has, and I don't remember exactly, I want to say it's over 100,000 um, of tenant improvements in their contract for moving their uh, administrative offices there. Uh, the other open purple area is pretty much ready to go except for cosmetics. We, we were touring that just recently. So um, we absolutely can break that out going forward um, and working with the um, um, entity that's the manager of the property for uh, a lot more detail on uh, each individual tenant and their expenses, not only rent roll, but um, in m and Thanks. All right. Well, I think I speak for a lot of people in saying that it's great that this is uh, being given this kind of proactive attention. So really appreciate it. And I, I think probably we just need a little more detail, but I'll just speak for myself that um, I like the general direction you're going. So. Okay. Well, thank you, council members. Um, we will bring you next steps in January. All right, next I have Marlene Feist to talk a little bit about city utility bill delinquencies. So, Marlene. Well, good morning. I'm going to share my screen here. So, this has obviously been something that's been on our mind and probably yours as well, and which is how are people doing uh, with, uh, you know, how are they doing with their bills? So, this is kind of a, a glimpse at that. Um, So clearly the pandemic is putting pressure on our customers. Um, the accounts that are delinquent over 30 days as of October have doubled since January and now um, total nearly $5 million. So as you know, we've taken a series of steps to try to help our customers over the, the last nine months. We suspended late fees and water shutoffs immediately and then that was followed with resolutions by the governor to do the same thing. Um, we did do a fundraising campaign for our U Help program, and we collaborated with our partners, SNAP, Salvation Army, and then with Avista. So half the half of our fundraising went to um, U Help for city utility bills, and half went to Project Share for energy bills. We have been obviously distributing U Help assistance. Um, we've helped gain other financial assistance for our customers, um, a couple of different grants: one from Anovia and one from a, a, a foundation called Xylem which included $7,500 for city utility bill assistance. Um, and we're also, we've also been setting up deferrals and payment plans for our customers uh, with interest-free. Uh, and um, we did attempt to get a CARES Act grant, um, but it turned out we were ineligible for that grant. So, of course, we're concerned about the health of our families and businesses. And um, long-term, we're concerned about the financial risk for um, critical utility services for our community. So this just looks 
terms of the delinquency rate, we have a lot better probably details in this, but you can just see the, the 30 to 60 day um, is in the blue and over 61 days uh, late is in red and those lines are continuing to go up. So this looks at dollars, it's a little easier to see. Um, the blue bars are 31 to 60 days, the red bars are that 61 to 90 and then green is over 90. So you can tell that more people are um, entering delinquency, those blue bars keep going up and those um, outstanding balances are continuing to age, which is why we're seeing the, the green bar um, grow quite a bit compared to, you know, when you compare January to October. So that's what we're seeing is a, you know, a pretty big trend um, over the last nine months. And really all of our customer groups are facing challenges. Um, we have the most residential customers, so that's why those bars are so long, but you can see the blue bars is in April and the green bars are in October. And for every group, we've got residential, multifamily, commercial, and then this sort of catch-all other group. Um, we're just continuing to see um, balances grow. This is actually a number of accounts, by the way. Um, we're gonna look at balances next. And there's the balances. So the, the red lines are um, the October numbers and the gray are from so uh, we have more customers and they owe more money over time as you might expect um, during the pandemic. So we adapted the U Help in March to assist more people. Um, we updated our contract with the, we continued our contract with the Salvation Army and we um, also partnered with SNAP which had more available resources. And we relaxed eligibility requirements to provide more customers with help. This provides about $130 per customer in relief. Um, there's that $150,000 we raised for utility assistance, half went to UHelp and half to Project Share. And we've continued to accept donations throughout the year. Um, so far this year, we've distributed more than $182,000 to customers yeah. through UHelp. But our UHelp funds are dwindling. Our balance right now is about $28,000. Um, here's some information on our repayment plans. Um, so when people come to us, they're happy to use the, well, the web self-service form. Sorry, my husband's talking at the same time. Um, and so that we now have interest-free payment plans and deferral totaling um, $96,000 in balances. Um, and once people get into those plans, they are being very effective at paying. And here's our kind of our next steps. We want to continue to promote interest rate payment arrangements for our customers. Um, we'd like to you know, talk to you about the possibility of seeking state or federal funding to support our customers. Uh, it's probably time for us to consider another round of fundraising, although right now with every nonprofit doing year end appeals, it's going to be um, hard to get through some of um, that to, to raise awareness for this particular need. Um, and we're going to continue to make needed operational changes to manage reduced cash flow and revenue. Does anybody have any questions? Councilmember Wilkerson? I was wondering. Oh, go ahead, oh. Councilmember Cathcart. Just, just really quick, I wondered, can you identify by neighborhood or uh, do you guys have numbers by neighborhood of where kind of a lot of these delinquencies have occurred by chance? You know, I could probably ask James to take a look at that. We could probably heat map it. Um, yeah. I haven't done that, but I sure can, I sure can do that. That'd be great. Thank you. Councilmember Wilkerson. I, I just want Marlene to just give me a little bit of idea of what operational changes would look like when she made that statement. Well, you know, um, as with the rest of the city, we have held positions open um, as we've needed to to, to make um, lower costs and we'd have to look at any expenditures and make sure that we can afford those. Um, you know, right now we're, we're, we're still doing okay, but um, it's just something that we have in our mind before we approve new purchases or um, go ahead with capital projects to make sure that we have the funding available to con continue to provide the services that our citizens expect. Thanks. Council Member Stratton. So I guess my concern is, 
um, at, at what point do we catch up um, when utility rates go up? And people are going to be paying more. I mean, at what point do they catch up, I guess, is my, is my question. I mean, how do we... I don't know if I'm making sense. It, I, I can't yeah. when I saw the numbers because I thought people are behind and we're, we're trying to help people and get people stable and keep the city stable. But then at what point do we get there when utility rates increase? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the bigger challenge probably isn't the 2.9% increase that we've put in. The, the bigger challenge is how do we help them get um, their past due amounts caught up? And so those interest repayment plans really, um, you know, are, are going to help. And if we can provide, um, if we, if there's a way that we could get um, a, a grant from the state or, or allowed to use some of the COVID dollars to do that, we could probably be looking at greater awards to individual families based on need. Right now, um, we're, we're limited with our U Help to smaller amounts because we just don't have. Uh, all of us, I mean, you see, you see at 130, we've given away $182,000. Right. So, um, you, you know, we didn't have the luxury of giving away three or $400 to a customer, but under a grant scenario, we might be able to. And so that's the part that I worry about, Karen, is that um, we, we, we have stopped water shutoffs and we stopped late fees, but, but that doesn't mean that the bill isn't increasing over time, as you can see, as those right. accounts have gone up. So, you know, the, the getting them caught up is, is, is the challenge that we will face over the next year or beyond. That's okay. Yeah. Because that's my concern is if this keeps going, that whole, right. that's what's frightening. Right. But thank you and thank everybody in utilities for um, the, the priority being to keep people, to not shut things off. That's, that's what's important and to keep people um, receiving services and trying to work through this. And Marlene, in terms of the long-term financial health to the ratepayer system, can you remind us of which types of utility bills become a lien on the property and which do not? Um, so the, 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 on the water side, you have the shutoff as your um, collection mechanism. The lien, I believe, is on the solid waste side. Okay, and that's, again, part of the problem. We don't have the water shutoff option, which understandably, we don't want to, but that's probably, that would normally take care of this in some ways in different times, but it's not going to Right, it normally regulates how much get, you know, how far people get behind is having that water shutoff um, tool, which we don't have right now. Um, and, you know, and the, the other challenge, of course, is that this isn't the only bill they have. I mean, their energy bills also could be um, piling up, and you know, and for some people too, they've taken advantage of, um, you know, a, a break on their rent and stuff. But it doesn't mean that those bills go away. They're just sort of stacking up behind them. So that's where I would start to worry about the financial health of the community. Councilmember Cathcart. Hey, Marlene, you had on your graph uh, multifamily on there that were delinquent, and I'm wondering. Uh, the numbers that you displayed, are those uh, multifamily units or are those individual duplexes, triplexes, apartment complexes? I mean, what, what is it that you're, you're totaling there? And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just a little concerned because there could be a lot of residents who live in those places that have no idea that their water is delinquent and, and essentially is subject to shut off if and when this, this were to go away. Right. And it depends on, on how most of them are built, you know, through one or more um, bills rather than individual bills to the to the apartment um, people who live in the apartments. Um, so you know you're not seeing a ton of. Let me go back to that. Um, when you look at numbers of accounts, um, let me share again here. So we have so many more residential accounts than multifamily in terms of just because of because they're grouped together. So you're not seeing, you're not seeing a ton here as compared to the, the number of residential accounts that are behind. But when you go to the, um, to the amount owed, it, it's a little closer. So, you know, that's one thing we do, you know, have is that those, 
those residents probably do not know that their 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 landlord is behind on their do we, utility bill payments. Do we have any sort of a, a requirement that that in in a situation like this where it's a, a multifamily um, unit that individual tenants would be notified before something like the water getting shut off would occur? Well, certainly when we go out and intend to shut off the water, you know, we would provide the notification out to the group. But, you know, in this case, there is no um, imminent change, so they may not realize how far behind their landlord is. Well, I, I had a situation once. I, I lived in a basement apartment for a period of time, and, and the landlord decided not to pay the, the power bill for a couple of months, came home, and my power was off. I, I had no warning or anything else, and fortunately, we were able to get it figured out, but I just, I hate to see that happen, particularly with, you know, vulnerable uh, populations that, you know, can't deal with, you know, getting that corrected. And so any, any way we can just make doubly sure that before any adverse, you know, uh, action is taken that, that we're doing everything we can to notify those folks, I think would be good. No, that's a very good point. Okay. So we kind of we're running out of time we got a, two more items to talk about but marlene thanks even though it's not happy news it's good to know what's going on uh, on that so thank you and we'll look forward after the first of the year to uh, other ideas to mitigate that situation all right uh carly court right we have you up for an update on banner installation Hi everybody, I will make this quick. Um, we have a MOU with both Comstock and Cliff Cannon neighborhood regarding installing some banners. Um, I'll go ahead and share those with you so you can see them. Um, this is in their business district. So uh, obviously Chris will be artwork. So this is for Cliff Cannon and then we have the Comstock neighborhood one. Uh, so essentially what we have developed um, with this MOU is because they'll be using existing poles, um, we wanted approval before they were able to hang anything off of those. So working with the street department to make sure that A, they're our own poles, not um, Avistas or somebody else's, and that they're not going to be damaged by modifying them to be able to, you know, most, some poles already are designed pole banners. Some of them are not. Um, I know for the Cliff Cannon area, they're planning to do them by huckleberries, um, where they used to use the hanging flower baskets. So just being able to sort of modify that. It's the neighborhood beautification. They paid for these banners through their community grant money that we do through the assembly. Um, and so it's just a better way of beautifying without having the maintenance of the flower basket. So uh, I guess that's pretty short and sweet. Any questions anyone has on that? Council Member. Who will be hanging the banners? Is that to the neighborhood or is that city? That they will be hanging the banners themselves. So they'll be responsible for the maintenance of them. Uh, the MOU is basically making sure that they're not doing anything damaging um, before they do that. Councilmember Mum. Oh, these rules are just beautiful. Um, the artwork is amazing. And I, I also want to mention, we have in process some other kinds of more permanent signage that I'd love to have us keep promoting through the neighborhoods to sort of identify um, you know, when you're coming across into a boundary, I'm thinking of uh, between Monroe and the Garland at the North Hill. They've just been working on this sign for, I think, a couple of years. I know five miles of the for there. I don't know if we can ever come up with funding to help them. I think the banners are great, but as you know, they're, they're going to last a couple of years and they're not maybe going to make it through some bad weather. But these permanent signs that identify you're coming into one of our, our neighborhoods, I just think that would be a great thing to be able to do for all 29 of our neighborhoods, something to work towards. One of my goals for next year is to really have ONS start working on grant opportunities um, that maybe we wouldn't be eligible as the city, but because the neighborhood councils are essentially a nonprofit, um, you know, they're independent, that they would be able to pay for. So we can leverage the experience of city staff to find grant, write the grant, and then the neighborhood would apply for it. And so hopefully we can do exactly that. So that's one of my goals. All right. Any other questions on that? All right, then, thank you, Carly and team. Uh, Nathan Groh uh, was going to give us 
uh, some more updated information on uh, electric patrol police vehicles. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, we don't have a presentation planned, um, but the in some extra information that I was able to gather from the police department um, was that it seems that we have about half of our patrol vehicles um, parked at least every day for about three to four hours that would offer some um, some room for charging the proposed electric uh, vehicles. If you have any other questions, uh, I'm open to answer any and everything. Okay. I think that was the main question, just knowing that uh, during graveyard, we have less vehicles out there, so they're down. They could be charged um, at least these, I think it's about every other day, the ones that you shared with us. And it sounds like the Model Y ones, we do have a contract with the state to get those if we want to, and those are the bigger, more preferable ones, if I recall. Is that fair to say? Yes, that is exactly correct. Okay. All right. That was the main question I was hoping you would answer. Is there anything else that anyone wants to ask about that? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, You're with, uh, with that everyone, we're gonna adjourn. We're gonna be back on um, the WebEx screen at 1.15 for Urban Experience. Uh, there was a bit of a glitch. The agenda wasn't posted on Friday like it normally would be, but it, I believe it is now posted. We, we think so. Um, and then secondly, just a heads up for council members, we are planning on having an executive session this afternoon during briefing. Briefing is going to be pretty short because we have, uh, we've, we're have we canceling the next two meetings. Uh, so probably, hopefully we'll be in executive session by about 345 or so to uh, talk about labor negotiations. So with that, we'll see you back at 115. We're adjourned.